Hello everyone out there. I'm Captain Neil. This is Captain Kevin Nichols and we are bringing to you a discussion about changing a recreational vessel to a charter vessel under subchapter T which is a small passenger vessel that measures less than a hundred gross tons. It takes less than 49 passengers for hire no, excuse me, less than 49 people in overnight accommodations and less than 150 passengers for hire. And this is the process that Kevin went through. Kevin is, he is a professor of maritime history and nautical archaeology. So he's, he's well versed in this type of research and just getting things done and looking up regulations and things like this. And this is the process that he had to go through. So here's Kevin. We have a couple points to take you through. We're just going to go through one by one and we'll chop it into several videos for you. Okay. Yeah, thanks Neil. I'm, I'm, I appreciate the opportunity to talk about the process. Um, my interest in maritime history and nautical archaeology is why I chose a schooner rigged vessel for the, uh, the classical lines and I think a lot of people doing day charters and day sales and corporate events and things like that appreciate the, uh, the, the nostalgia value of being able to be on a classic vessel. So Definitely. that was why um, I went with a steel-hulled sailing schooner. Of course the problems are when you're picking a boat out that's a little unusual or one that's a one-off boat like this is all the regulations come to bear and it's a great deal of research as you pointed out yeah. to find a vessel but even once you find a vessel um, and there's a lot of variables that go in there, so it's not just a matter of finding a boat and saying, I want to buy that boat. It's a great way to get yourself into a lot of trouble, and often you'll find a boat that isn't even eligible for conversion. Yeah, break out another thousand. Yeah. That's what boat stands for, yeah. right? This can be an expensive process. Yeah. And, and because you have to comply with Federal Coast Guard safety regulations, and they're good regulations, I'm not... Uh, I'm not trying to disparage the Coast Guard. There's a reason why our maritime history, our maritime uh, merchant marine, and our maritime activities have a very great safety record, uh, very safe practices. But to achieve that level of uh, sophistication and safety, it can be an expensive and daunting process. And Neil was wise enough to decide to make some videos and along with his captain's class to try to take some of the uncertainty out of the process. So for people who are considering going down this path, our, our conversation today, I really hope, uh, either takes some of the fear out of it or they might go, yeah, maybe that's not for me. Yeah, it <laughs> and might so, help you not buy the wrong boat right off the bat because right. there's certain, there's a chain of custody, right? What's? Yeah, you're absolutely right. There's something called the Jones Act, which is, uh, I believe it's the Merchant Marine Act of 1920. Uh, Jones Act is what it's most commonly referred to as. And what that essentially means, and it applies to any commercial vessel, not a recreational vessel, any vessel that will be eligible for commercial, what we call coastwise uh, passage, coastwise work or cabotage is the word for it, meaning yeah. coastwise trade, has to comply with the Jones Act rules. What that means is the boat has to be built in the United States and it has to have a chain of custody. The owners have to be American citizens, it has to be built by Americans, and throughout this entire process there cannot be uh, a foreign flagging of the vessel or for foreign ownership. You can override the Jones Act, but it's very difficult, uh, up to including a act of Congress to reflag a vessel back into U.S. service. So that's the first step that burns a lot of people, is they'll find a beautiful yacht that was built by Canada or Germany or some other area with a strong maritime industry and you think oh it's a well-built yacht and it is but the Jones Act precludes it in a lot of ways from being able to enter coastwise service as a small passenger mm -hmm. vessel um, one last thing about that there is something called a cruise to nowhere and it can apply to small passenger vessels what that means is if a boat pulls into the same port that leaves like a carnival cruise liner or you have a lot of foreign oil tankers right. that might pull into Louisiana take on oil or unload oil and they leave right away. That's a cruise to nowhere. Sometimes you can get a waiver to do that, but if you're a charter vessel uh, doing any sort of day sales and things of this nature, if you're in a port in whatever your home state is, in my case it's Michigan, I operate out of Port Huron, Michigan with this schooner, and I wanted to go north, say, to uh, Lexington, only 20 miles up the coast, if I had a port, uh, a cruise to nowhere authorization, the minute I went up there to take on passengers, I'm in violation of the law. 
because I entered one U.S. port to another. Yeah. And so the, you can get waivers for the Jones Act, but it's far better just to know what you're getting into from the beginning, the purpose of this video, to do your research and pick a boat that's eligible. Right, so that's the Jones Act, and if you buy a really nice boat from Germany, it is not, it may not be eligible or very difficult, much more difficult, to get it ready for inspection. Right. And, and essentially, it, it, it's not eligible. Um, you're, you're buying, at that point, you're rolling the dice, you're buying a boat that really is not eligible for coast-wise endorsements, and at that point, you're hoping you'll be able to get a waiver for it, so my suggestion would be to do a great deal of research to find a U.S. built boat and start the research and documenting process even before you make an offer. Yeah. A lot of due diligence will save you a lot of heartache down the road. So it can't be owned by a Canadian. Or built by or a foreign country. Okay. So that pretty much sums up the Jones Act, and that's really the first thing to look for when that's, you're buying a boat. Make sure it's built in the U.S. and it's had U.S. owners. Yep, throughout its whole time, whole chain of custody. And then the next step that we're going through is um, there's a waivers. Yep, you're absolutely correct. Um, the, the other factor for a Coast Guard small passenger vessel, um, most of them are built from the keel up as a passenger vessel and the Coast Guard inspects them while they're going through their construction process and signs off on each phase of the process. Um, I, uh, perhaps, uh, you know, being thick-headed and stubborn, <laughs> uh, I found this boat that I really think will, will serve well and went through the conversion process. Actually, the Coast Guard advised me not to. They said to do a boat conversion is a very expensive, very time-consuming process and there are no guarantees. Um, doing a lot of research can reduce your risk and you can manage your risk, but it's never without a slight leap of faith and roll of the dice. The five-year waiver, uh, uh, as you mentioned, the waiver process, any new boat that's built from the keel up, most of these boats are, it's inspected, it's ready to go from the day it's launched. Technically, a boat that is over five years old is not eligible for conversion to a subchapter T boat. So, okay. and that's called the five-year waiver. And the five-year waiver is somewhat perfunctory. It is easy to get a waiver for it. What you basically have to do is, um, what I did, is I had an architect come out and inspect the boat before I made an offer. Right. So I had found the boat, I thought it would work, I, I liked it, but a lot of this doesn't matter about what I like. It matters what <laughs> the Coast Guard likes. Yeah. The architect came out and looked at this boat and said, I think uh, this boat is very uh, well built. I think it's a great candidate for conversion. He had worked with the local Coast Guard, the OCMI, the, the Marine Inspector. So yep. he had the, the Coast Guard officer, the inspector come out and it's and what it's called is basically it's called a credit dry dock and hull inspection. And so that you, you pay the fee online to the Coast Guard and it's really quite reasonable. It's $300 for the year and as many times as the Coast Guard has to come out to inspect stuff they will for that one fee. <clears throat> okay. That's really not so that bad. Is, that makes sense. Yeah, and so the Coast Guard inspector came out and he looked over the boat and um, this was a Coast Guard San Juan who's been very reasonable to work with. In fact, we're we're sitting in the Caribbean on the boat yeah, right now. In St. Thomas. In St. Thomas. And um, he came out and looked over the boat and said, yes, I, I would grant this boat a waiver without hesitation. So what happened in my case is the architect liked it, the Coast Guard inspector here liked it, but since I'm ultimately operating out of Port Huron, Michigan, OCMI Detroit has the final say on it. And so the Coast Guard here contacted the Coast Guard in Detroit and said, here's what's going on, here's the project number for this boat. I would grant it a waiver without hesitation. And Coast Guard Detroit, being very good to work with, very user friendly, said, if you like it, we like it. Okay, so now... So I had the five-year waiver after those steps, but um, if you're buying... And, and the lesson here is if you're buying a boat out of state, say you're buying a boat from Georgia and you're going to be operating in New Jersey, for example, make sure your local Coast Guard is on board with the plan because just because the Coast Guard, where the state that the boat's located likes it, your, your state and port that you're going to be operating out of will have final jurisdiction and, and say on whether it gets authorized. Yeah, so this is all before we even make an offer yes. on a boat that we want it. So we have to make sure the chain of custody, the Jones Act, 
is good. And now we had to get a five year waiver if the vessel was over five years old yep. from the officer in charge of marine inspection or OCMI. Correct. And where you get the boat and where it's going to be. We need these Coast Guards they to know. They have to be talking to each other. And now you said you took another step where you had a marine architect. This is all before we buy it. You had a mm -hmm. marine architect come in and and you consult with the marine architect. Absolutely. Um, the marine architect I've been working with, he's really been the lead on this project. Um, you know, he's familiar with subchapter T regulations. He's uh, well versed in the process and things of that nature. So he's been able to keep the project moving forward. Um, and a, a lot of times it seems like all I've been doing is answering emails and calls and writing checks, um, right. which is really my job at this point. Um, you know, the, you know, he's in charge of, you know, he's kind of like the, uh, you know, the ringleader of a circus. And, you know, the circus is comprised of, you know, the Coast Guard and mechanics and electricians. Right. And he keeps the project moving forward. So it's very crucial to find a marine architect, not just anyone, one who's familiar with subchapter T small passenger vessel regulations. Right. That, I can't place enough value on that. So, yeah, he, he looked over the boat even before I made an offer. So now you've done these three things. You've done the Jones Act and you complied. You did the five-year waiver. It complied yep. with your OCMI, officer in charge of marine inspections. And now you have an architect well-versed in subchapter T regulations. Yes. So now that all this is done, you were ready to make an offer yep. on the Jade Lady. Right. Um, at that point, I was able to make an offer on it. And uh, in some ways, for people who are interested in going through this process, in some ways there are a lot of uh, factors. You know, it's a long process before you make an offer. But in my case, you know, this is a steel-hauled sailing schooner. It's kind of a little bit more of an eclectic boat. It's not like your average you know, fiberglass sloop. So the market for this boat was smaller, and because I was saying, look, I'm converting this boat, and I'm gonna have to do all these different things, I was able, and I had the Coast Guard back me up and an architect back me up, I was able to uh, negotiate pretty aggressively. Yeah. And so that worked out very well. And, and you know, obviously you wanna get the best price possible and preserve as much of your capital for the conversion process. And once uh, that was done, we made the offer, the next step, uh, we needed to do was to get the boat Coast Guard documented. Okay. Yeah, and I can I can <clears throat> explain that a little bit here. Um, basically, um, your boat has to be what's called. You can get a Coast Guard documentation, and oftentimes it'll say for recreation. Right. That you have to have the Jones Act compliance for the boat to be documented as a coastwise vessel. Yeah, and I saw your documentation. It said recreation, and then it said coastwise. Right. That is on the that key document. Yeah, if you don't have coastwise documentation, the boat cannot be converted into a, a small passenger right, vessel. And you won't end up with a COI, right. a certificate of inspection, which ultimately is the goal. Right, until you get your certificate of inspection and a few other documents, your stability report, right. your route letters, you are not authorized to be basically in business. Right, what's a martini bar without a liquor license? Exactly, and so without that documenting coastwise, which is crucial, um, that's a showstopper. Um, when I told the uh, Coast Guard Detroit, now that I'm getting done with this process, and I, I have the final inspections set up, um, one of the things he asked me is, well, did you get your Coast Guard documentation? I said, yes. He says, is it documented coastwise? I said, yes. And he's like, well, you're way ahead of the game. A lot of people don't even get that far. Right. <laughs> so um, it's it's been uh, frustrating and rewarding and very educational to process. I mean, learning these regulations, you have to know these things because you know, anyone that inspects your boat, regulations are subject to interpretation. Right. I could read something and say, I think this. Captain Neal could read and say, I think that. And you need to be able to present your case should there be any uh, disagreements. And the Coast Guard's very reasonable to work with, but if you don't know the regulations, you know, how can you argue your case right. if you don't even know what you're discussing? And all of these regulations are Title 46, Subchapter T. Yeah. Small passenger vessels. Yes, and yes, see uh, Code of Federal Regulations, so CFR, and I can't remember right offhand the numbers from a certain number to a certain number are all the um, all the subchapter T regulations. Right, and now it starts to go into systems. Correct. Right, the systems on this vessel, the Jade Lady, they had to be revamped. Electricity. We had certain gauges of wires. The plumbing. Yeah. Tell us a little bit about that process. Yeah, so, so at, at this point, um, you know, in kind of recapping the dialogue, you found a boat you like. You're able to f 
make sure it was com in compliance with the Jones Act. So you got the Jones Act and the chain of custody down, you got the five year waiver, you had an architect inspect it, you had the Coast Guard inspect it, and then you just and you got your credit dry dock and hull inspection. At that point you've said this boat is eligible. We think it's a good candidate for conversion. You have now bought the boat. So congratulations and my condolences. Right. Um, you're, you're, <laughs> you're going down this path like I have. And yeah, and what you say at this point now, you're, you're starting to get into systems. Um, the first one that they're going to check is the hull. They'll do um, the various um, radio type testing. I can't remember the exact name of the, uh, the like, it's like an ultrasonic machine. They'll test the hull for thickness <clears throat> right. to determine if there's been any wastage is the term. And if you have a certain amount of wastage on your hull, now you have to start replacing plates. When I bought this boat, um, sometimes doing those tests can be a little destructive. In other words, you're taking paint off the hull to get the most accurate test. So you have to remove some of the inside carpentry to get to a bare hull. The original owner who I bought the boat from uh, was fantastic to work with. He, he did far above and away what he needed to do to dig up old records for me to be able to document the boat. But he did say, look, I can't have you taking you know, paint off the boat before you've even bought it. And that's very right. reasonable on his part. So it was a leap of faith on on my part, but you know, after the boat was done, I had the hull sounded basically. It was solid, no wastage, it's still in, in fantastic shape. So that was the first step is to ensure the hull was good, and it was. So that was, uh, I was able to check that block. But what, uh, what Neil mentions is the next main things were basically you're dealing with mechanical electrical plumbing. Right. And on this boat, Basically, that required a complete redo. So from a mechanical perspective, uh, from a plumbing perspective, the boat has 15 through hulls, all of which need to be replaced with steel and bronze through hulls. Any sort of fiberglass or mylar or whatever the various synthetic materials yeah. they use, while they might be in some ways better, uh, they're not authorized. You cannot use those, and the valves have to be sort of like, like um, ball valves, I believe you can't use. It has to be a, a levered gate valve. Right. You know, it has to be a stouter construction. So all those need to be replaced, and most of my plumbing had to be replaced because a lot of, uh, like, your venting and your exhaust loops and things of that nature, they'll use different materials that the Coast Guard says you can't use. So I have vented loops with... Uh, they had to custom make like fiberglass elbows right. and things to make everything work. So the plumbing was quite an undertaking. So most of that had to be redone in the electrical work, as you pointed out. Uh, Coast Guard regulations require all electrical wire has to be at least 14 gauge wire. Uh, I believe it's a 14 gauge tinned wire. Uh, wire nuts are not allowed. So anytime there's an end point, the wire it has to be a terminal. You know, and you have to screw it in and everything else. You can't use uh, just the wire nuts. Right. And the wire also, I believe, has to be anchored every 18 inches. Anytime it's going through a bulkhead, any sort of plumbing or wiring has to have chafing around it. Right. So there's no erosion. So, yeah, it's, it's an involved process. So the plumbing all has to comply with the regulations. The electric, again, 14-gauge wire, no wing nuts. Everything has to be at terminals. It has to be anchored approximately every 18 inches. A lot of 18 and 16 gauge wires came out of this boat. Oh, mounds of it. Yeah, yeah, it was it was stacks of wire and stacks of plumbing. Um, <clears throat> almost all of it basically had to be redone to, to bring in compliance. And that's not unusual. It's not that this was a, a poor case. Most recreational vessels use 16 gauge or 18 gauge or, or you know different sort of sorts of PVCs and conduit that's perfectly acceptable for a recreational boat but is completely unacceptable for by Coast Guard standards. Right. <clears throat> and that's this whole process is complying absolutely to these standards. So in the end we get a certificate of inspection. Yep. And you know what I would also suggest is get to know your Coast Guard inspector. I've worked with Coast Guard Detroit. They probably hate me by now, actually, um, because every time I had a problem, I was calling them or emailing them, um, but they need to be your friends. You need to be calling them, and each step of the process, let them know what you're doing, and make sure they say, yeah, according to this regulation, it's okay. And then you can, go, and then you can tell your contractors, or if, you're, or if you're handy enough, you can do the work. But you know, make sure you say, I, I'm not sure about this or that, and I need to go ahead and make sure I'm doing this properly. And they'll they'll check the regulations and they might send it to you verbatim. And did they point you into the right direction a lot of the times to oh, yeah. tell you where, you know, 46, subchapter T, and then the number? The inspector I'm working with, any time he threw out a, uh, a regulation to me, or at least, you know, this is, the, this is the verbiage attached to a specific regulation, he would 
also associate it to the specific uh, Code of Federal Regulations. And what I ended up doing is I found all the, code, the CFRs online. Uh, it might be something that we can provide a link to from your course. Oh, definitely. And then I just went through and printed every regulation and put them in binders based on, you know, this is a hall one, this is electric, this is this. So, you know, I'm, I'm rapidly developing a, a CFR library that I can reference and pull out should I need to. So yeah, absolutely, the plumbing needed a huge amount of work as well as the electrical. And then after you went through plumbing and electric, we had fire suppression. Yes, um, that is uh, another big factor for a boat. So any sort of boat is going to have fire extinguishers, but you need to have a what well, you need to have a fire suppression system uh, and fixed. Yeah, fixed fire suppression system in your engine room, and it's not just that simple. For example, um, most sailboats. This is a sailboat. Most sailboats, even power boats, will have a bilge. So under the flooring in the engine room, the the regulations say the engine room must be contained. It doesn't need to be airtight, hermetically sealed, but I had to have a carpenter come in to make templates to be able to seal off things where the piping is running, where the bilge is running. So in the event that you have to activate your fire suppression system, it's not all just pouring past the engine into the bilge and it's not doing its job. Right. It's, it's suffocating that fire because That's it's right. a contained... Yeah, it has to be contained, so a carpenter did that. And um, the key for a small boat is you can find... Uh, you can find fire suppression companies and, and make sure they build things for vessels and they'll, they'll say maritime or Coast Guard approved. Um, one of the key things that the Coast Guard likes to see for a small passenger vessel is what's called a pre-engineered system. Okay. The pre-engineered system is nice because the Coast Guard knows exactly what it is. You can say this is my model number. Right, and this they say, is a flame boy, and this is the model number. Right, and they've they can, seen it. Yep, and they'll. And the the key for this is they'll measure the square footage of your engine room and make sure that the bottle has enough uh, uh, agent in there to fill up those cubic feet. Mm -hmm. So you know, I have a flame, you know, fire boy system. This is my model number. The bottle is big enough because this is the cubic foot of my engine room, and then it has to have a pull handle outside the engine room somewhere. Right. It can, you know, be at the helm station, it can be in the companion way, but you know, if the engine room's on fire, you can't go in the engine room to activate this. Right, or so, shut off the fuel. Our Flame yeah. Boy on a 31 foot Ocean Pro parasail boat, we have the fuel shut off and the fire, the, yep. the fixed fire system. And you just pull them right and there. You pull, just like a fire extinguisher, you pull a ring, and then pull it out and shut the fuel off. And then it also has, we have vents to the engine room. We're working with a 5.2 liter diesel mm -hmm. and, it, and snaps. So we have canvas and we snap it on the vents. There's four of them. Oh, okay. We snap them on the vents, all four of them, and then pull the fire right. suppression. So it's, again, sealed engine room. And exactly. that isn't going to escape. Right, so and in, in, you know, that's a great example for um, the regulations for like a parasailing boat, which is a very different animal than a schooner, but the concept is the same. When I'm underway, my engine room door needs to be closed. My engine room is then you know, contained right. because I've got the, the floorboards covered and uh, the throughways through the bills, there's blockages in there to contain the material. And then what happens there is if I have to activate it, the uh, vents close, the fuel gets shut off, and the bottle dumps. Right. And so that's that's the same concept. But you know, the pre-engineered system is what the Coast Guard likes to see, simply because they can cross-reference that and know it's adequate for your particular vessel's needs. Very good. And and so these are the, basically the systems we went through: electrical, plumbing, and the fire systems were mm -hmm. the main systems, and make sure the hull is sounded or X-rayed. Yep. Pretty much. And, yeah, and, and on the hull thing, just to kind of cap, thing off, cap things off, one thing I've been told, I don't know if it's true or not, um, I suspect there's some uh, interpretation to it. Overall, I was told that the Coast Guard doesn't necessarily like to work as much with wood vessels because there's a lot of variables with wood vessels. Now, there's plenty of old wood certified vessels out there, right? but because uh, it's the way the material works and the erosion and wood rot and things of that nature. And wood catches fire. Yeah, I think, um, I think my impression is if you were able to find a steel or aluminum or a fiberglass hull that complies with the regulation, even a ferro cement boat, I've seen those with right. COIs. Yep. Um, I'm not saying don't get a wood vessel. It's just if I was to look 
for a wood vessel of any sort, I would probably try to find one that already had a COI. Right. And then just buy a boat that's already certificated and already is basically a functioning vessel uh, because I think the conversion process for a wood, wood boat, um, the Coast Guard is pretty strict on those for the obvious reasons. Wood rot, they're more susceptible to fire, things of that nature. And there's really plenty of good you know, steel, fiberglass, and other materials out there. Again, if wood is, if, if you have the uh, desire to own a wood vessel of any sort, I would just recommend doing a little more due diligence and really check the regulations out and really talk to the Coast Guard before you were to uh, write a check for it. Yeah. You know, just, just to be safe so you know what you're getting yourselves into. So once, and another part of this is stability, right? Yep, the stability system uh, is a, a giant factor. Um, one last thing to touch on just real yeah. quick is the fuel system. The fuel system. And yeah, that's, you know, as we covered everything, that's really the last major system we've discussed. You know, uh, the, we've discussed the hull and things of this nature, uh, fire suppression, plumbing, electrical. The fuel system has to have a combination of uh, copper tubing is what the regulations say, and a combination of copper tubing that's mounted to a the bulkhead or things of that nature to resist vibration. And I believe the regulations say you can use up to 30 inches of, I believe it would be like a, a CG type 1A1 hosing right. from the engine to the tubing, because of course you can't have a copper tubing running directly into the engine, it would just vibrate and leak and right. things of that nature. So that would be the last thing is to verify your fuel system needs and requirements. And I believe the regulations from what I was looking at and having done is a combination of copper tubing and then some of the... the uh, short runs of flexible hose. Right. That are in compliance with the... Absolutely. Everything from wire to hose to through haul fittings are all spelled out in the regulations and you absolutely need to use those. But yeah, the last thing you mentioned just recently is um, the stability report. And that is... That's really crucial, especially for sailboats, because um, you know everyone knows a sailboat heels, you know, leans on its side as it's sailing, which is great for the boat. That complies <laughs> with the laws of physics, uh, but the laws of physics don't always comply with Coast Guard regulations. And so the stability report is the boat is basically um, anchored in some water in calm water, and the marine architect, what they do is they build a series of pendulums throughout the boat. And right. they're able to then start weighting the boat down in different areas to see how far it leans over. And you had to take everything extra off this boat. Yeah, everything, uh, and that was a chore because this boat had a lot of stuff on it. But yes, the boat has to basically be stripped down to basically nothing on the boat except you know some sails. And there's different rules with regards to how much uh, diesel would be in the tanks or how much water would be in the water tanks. And you can you can check the regulations out for that. But essentially the boat had to be stripped down and then they would put the pendulums on it, weight it, and determine basically how much stability or reserve stability the boat had. Now that number is basically meaningless until the Coast Guard gets the information. So the architects do the stability study, or they'll call it an incline study or a stability study, and that number is computed as reserve stability. And then what happens is when the Coast Guard comes out to inspect your vessel, they measure things like how much seating you have available on the boat, um, how much railing you have, how much the lengths of your railing. And what they use is they use the seating available plus the weight of stability plus the average weight of a passenger, which was just up to um, 185 pounds, I believe. Right. And the width of a passenger is 22 inches. Right. So, right? You, yes, you have 22 inches of width. Basically, per, uh, every seat on the boat needs to be at least 22 inches, and the passenger's Average weight is now 185 pounds, and they use that in the formula with your reserve stability to compute what the passenger capability uh, for your vessel is. And passenger capability translates to paying passengers, which translates to your business. Right, and we're, our goal is to get a COI, a certificate of inspection, which means we have more than six. Yes. It's um, hard to make money on a charter boat with six people well yeah I, I mean I see a lot of the fishing guys do it and things of that right. nature I you know they seem to be doing uh, they seem to be enjoying themselves but all the reports I read and all the information I read and talking to other captains is if you're doing day charters or things like that you really need to be looking at 15 to 18 at a minimum to have any chance of you know having a you know decent amount of uh, income off the business to support the vessel and you as the captain 
things of that nature. Um, it's, it's, it's pretty crucial. And also more passengers then allows the boat to open up to more functions. If right. I can only take 15, that's not a bad number, but if I can take 25, now I'm looking at maybe some graduations or family reunions right. or maybe some um, you know parties of some sort and things of that nature. You bachelor parties? Uh, bachelor, bachelor parties, at bachelorette parties. parties. Um, sadly, we'll we'll do the whole life cycle: bachelor, bachelorette, divorce parties. Um, <laughs> you know, whatever uh, whatever the people want the boat for. But being able to take more people, uh, that translates into more money for your business. And so, and, and if you are unhappy with what the Coast Guard says, any regulation, you have every right to. Uh, basically petition and say I disagree with this and here's my case and here's my argument and then that would go up the Coast Guard chain of command and at that point um, the commander of the area would have final say but if an inspector says something and you really feel that he or she made an error any rule and regulation can be contested through the Coast Guard chain of command. And so, at this point being having known these people and becoming friends almost colleagues in a sense with the officer in charge of marine inspection where the boat is now and where it's going to be is going to come in handy if you oh, yeah. start to petition certain points well it absolutely is and you know my dealings with the coast guard so far have really been quite good um, I've, you know, I, it's never been confrontational. They've always been very professional. You know, I, I fully believe that the Coast Guard wants you to succeed. They want they, it to be safe. Yeah, they have no reason to want you to not have a successful business and be on the water taking people out and having a good time. But, of course, they want the boat to be safe. And they're the ones who finally, you know, they sign off on it. And once they stamp it and say, we think this vessel is safe, if there's a problem, then it could call their integrity into question. And yours as the captain. Right. And no one wants that. So it's, it's you know, I've never thought of it as confrontation. I thought, they're helping explain the regulations to me. I'm trying to comply with the regulations. And if there's any problems, we discuss it. So it, it's been a pretty good process. I've never had, you know, any concern. I think, oh, oh, you know, this is terrible. I have to deal with the Coast Guard. That's not been the case at all. You know, I have you know, every thought and intention to believe they, they want this process to work. And they're there to help you achieve your certificate of inspection, which is the goal. Right. And so. right along the topic of safety, after all of this is done, now you, you have to do fire drills, man overboard drills, yes. yearly. Yes. Um, and, and everything, even once you're issued your certificate of inspection, every year that boat gets reinspected. Yeah. And sometimes the regulations change and then you have to comply with them. Or your inspector changes. If, yeah, if your inspector changes and the previous guy or you know previous ins uh, inspector, you had a good relationship with him or her, this new guy, uh, he or she may have a very different set of priorities or criteria that they focus on, and now you need to you know, build the rapport with this person. I've been an observer to several, and a participant in several yearly certificate of inspection, re-inspections, mm -hmm. and I watched the schooner Manitou in Traverse City go through and, and not receive an 835, as that's what the Coast Guard writes up for a deficiency, not for 10 years. Mm. Ten years, none. Well, they switch Coast Guard stations. The state switched Coast Guard ah. stations, and the new guys came on, interpreted the laws differently, and there were several 835s written up. Nothing big, mm -hmm. just small stuff that came from different interpretations Absolutely. and training of the new guys sure. from this particular person, and they had subchapter right. T on them. And they actually, this boat had a COI so long they had old subchapter T and new subchapter T because there were certain grandfathered aspects which I found Absolutely. interesting. Yep. So those drills become... Yeah, once you're given your... Uh, once you have a COI, once you have your stability report which tells you how many passages you can take, you're issued a route letter which basically it dictates how far offshore you can go with how many passengers and that would also dictate what type of safety gear you need. Do you need a life a life raft, if so, for how many people? Mm -hmm. Do you need an EPIRB? You know, these are the right. things that your route letter would dictate. How many life jackets, and how many of those life jackets must be for children? Right. And the name of the vessel on the life jacket. Absolutely, you you're absolutely have to have the name of uh, the vessel on each life jacket. If one of those life jackets were to blow over off, off deck and into the water and you can't retrieve it, you have to notify the Coast Guard. It's got they, the name of your vessel. Now they think there's a body in the water somewhere because there's an empty jacket. 
Right. So you you know you have to notify the coast guard. If you have um you have fire access, have to have your vessel's name on it. You have right. to have a certain number of you know flares and fire signals and a certain number of throwable life rings. That's interesting. I know you needed a Category One EPIRB for this. Did it need the vessel's name? On the EPIRB? Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. The vessel had to have the EPIRB had to be registered to the vessel as a commercial vessel for how many passengers. That way, in the event that something were to happen to the vessel and it were to sink, you know, it would be a tra tragic. But if it were to go down, the Coast Guard would know it could potentially be carrying X amount of passengers. Right. So they know how much rescue assets they need to send. You also have to radio um, register your radio FCC license. Mm -hmm. which is not hard to do. Um, you go online and now there's not a test or anything, but you still need to pay the uh, fee and get the, get the form, which has your station identification so information and things on it. You need to license your radio, and in, in some cases you need a marine radio operator's permit. Right. Yes, yeah, so you have to have both licenses. And they're not difficult to get, but you still have to have those. And something that seems obvious, but we didn't mention, is you need your captain's license for this venture. Absolutely. Um, yeah, beyond any doubt, um, you know, before anything happens, um, I would definitely look into getting a captain's license first, because none of this matters if you don't have a license. And certain things come into huge play. Um, if you're colorblind and you didn't know you were colorblind, you can still get a captain's license, but it may be restricted to only daylight operation. If you wanted to do nighttime astronomy tours and right. stargazing and you find, you find yourself colorblind, that's going to alter your business plans. Um, you can get a restricted ticket if there's any sort of colorblindness issues and things of that nature. So I would absolutely uh, look into doing the captain's license as a first step. And um, honestly, you couldn't find better people to teach the captain's class than Neil, Brian, and their associates. Yeah, thank you. No, I, I appreciate I, that. I took my captain's training through their class, and it was uh, it was quite quite spectacular. And I was at the first step of this process is if I can't get my license, then none of the other stuff matters. So I would definitely uh, highly, you know, you know, it's just not the fact that we're sitting here. I would definitely endorse uh, endorse and recommend their their captain's course as the jumping off point for anyone interested in obtaining a, a, a certificated you know, subchapter T boat, you need the license before anything else. Right. So I think I think we're pretty we are we're almost at the end of this conversation it seems and well do you have final points or what other points would you like um, to bring up for, for the people at home and yeah. YouTube? Well the, I guess I would I would I would, you know, finally say what will as this process finishes and we're just about done with everything here, hopefully the boat will be inspected and uh, underway uh, July. I'm really hoping to be done with everything and being able to take passengers on there. Um, once everything's done, then at that point with your business being set up, if you've informed a, you know, a, a corporation for your business, however you want to structure yourself, then you want to start looking at hiring crew. You have to have drug tests set up. For yourself, for your crew, it's a fifth. I believe the Coast Guard can randomly select people, or 50% of the people will be drug tested yeah. every year, and you and need go to go into a consortium. Right, okay. and when your number comes up, you have to go to the local occupational health agency and and do a drug test. So you want to set all that up, and then your crew need to be able to work whatever your vessel is. So you want to have competent crew in the drills you mentioned. There is. Um, firefighting drills, there are right. man overboard drills, there are several other safety things uh, and safety drills that the Coast Guard will test you and on. you will do those every year Yes. before your season starts if you have a COI and Absolutely. you'd like to keep it. Yeah, so every year you need to have competent crew who are well trained and know what they're doing and be able to go out and do these drills and prove to the Coast Guard that in any sort of eventuality from a fire to a man overboard to any of these other possibilities, you've been inspected and certified to be able to do this. Um, for anyone interested in following this process and see how it goes, um, you know, who's interested in seeing how things work out with this, you know, Neil's up in Traverse City, Michigan. I operate out of Port Huron, Michigan. And uh, the vessel has a Facebook page, Lady of the Lakes Sail Charters, that you can find out uh, what's going on there. And as things are going on, you can certainly um, see the progress of the COI process and how things are taking off. And I um, certainly think you could uh, email me or Neil and get information on this. Either one of us would be more than happy to help talk to people who are going through this process. But I think uh, the discussion we had uh, this afternoon is really a good jumping off point. I mean, certainly do your own due diligence, learn the rules, learn the regulations. But some of the uh, 
the, the pitfalls and trials and issues that I've been able to learn and been able to avoid, uh, we discussed today and hopefully that'll make the process uh, run much smoother for whoever's out there who gets a chance to look at this video who thinks, you know, hey, I think I'd like to be a, a charter boat captain of some sort. Hopefully this will save you a lot of time and kind of get you off on the, uh, the right path and save you a lot of trouble down the road. Well, thank you, Kevin. This has been very informative, and we'll follow this process up once we get once you get this boat to port here on. That's right. And get that COI in hand, and we'll see how it all played out, and give some afterthoughts in a in the next video. Yeah, once the once everything's done, then I can sit down and we'll discuss a now that it's done. You know, hope you know. Does is is there a happy ending to this story? Hindsight's and, twenty twenty, yeah, isn't and, it? and go, yeah, this was great. You know, the Coast Guard at the beginning said you're better off just buying a boat with a certificate. You know, they said you buy the COI, but they throw the boat in for free. Right. You know, when you're buying it, but I said no, I really like this boat. So we'll we'll be able to say in the next couple months whether um, all this has worked out or not. So far, I think we're doing quite well, and um, I appreciate Neil giving me the chance to explain the process, and hopefully uh, we'll be able to meet back up in a month or two and kind of do a recap on how everything went. All right. Sounds good. Thank you, Kevin. Thanks a lot, Neil. Thanks okay. for having me.